understand the implications of all that is happening around us. And you've promised wisdom for those who would ask. And Father, we're asking again this morning and trusting in faith that you will, that you will be here and that you will provide the wisdom that we need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was about three weeks ago that Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of a uh, biomedical startup company named Theranos, was found guilty of conspiracy to defraud investors and some wire wire wiring money charges along with that. Now, Holmes had a remarkable story. If you've read her story, in 2003, she dropped out of Stanford at the age of 19 to pursue the idea of coming up with a device that would, with a few drops of blood, be able to do all the tests that a major lab has to do currently. And it was an idea that was pretty remarkable. It had the potential to change the healthcare industry. With such a uh, promising perspective, she was able to raise about $945 million from an impressive list of investors and signed major contracts with Walgreens and Capital Blue Cross. And in 2014, Theranos had reached a value of $9 billion. Holmes became one of Silicon Valley's brightest stars, although her testing methods and her technology remained veiled in secrecy. She was featured on magazine covers and interviewed on TV, but it was all premised on a lie. A lie that Holmes tried to perpetuate by claiming trade secrets barred her from answering probing questions about the technology and the company's finances. In 2015, the Wall Street Journal published interviews with ex-employees who claimed that Theranos had exaggerated the capability of the technology and was deceiving the public. And over the next two years, as Theranos came under increasing scrutiny by federal regulators, Things began to unravel, and in June of 2018, a federal grand jury indicted Theranos, or invited, indicted Holmes and the former president of Theranos of engaging in a multi-million dollar scheme to defraud investor, investors and a separate scheme to defraud doctors and patients. Never delivering on its promises, Theranos closed in 2018. Now, if you're like me, when you hear a story like that, you wonder how so many people could be convinced of something that simply wasn't true. Now, in fairness to those who invested in Theranos, Holmes had a great idea, even though it wasn't possible. And of course, there were red flags along the way, but people simply didn't want to believe that Holmes was lying and that they had been deceived. Now, I wonder if the same thing could happen to us. Is it possible to ignore the signs around us that the liberties we have enjoyed and the blessings of freedom are coming to an end as prophecy indicated that they eventually would? Could the desire we have for something not to be true blind us to the reality of what actually is true? And could we fall prey to gradual habituation? Could we miss the signs because the changes occur so slowly like a farmer in a field never sees the corn growing until the day it is over his head? Now, the Bible warns us that those who are unaware or otherwise ignorant of what is going on around them, particularly in the last days, are extremely vulnerable to being deceived. Our perspectives on current events should be shaped by a deep understanding of Revelation 12, 13, and 14, and not by the curated messaging coming from those in the mass media who hold the reins on the distribution of information. Now, through Bible prophecy, we know that just prior to the return of Jesus, amidst the applause of most of the world, that Satan will foment an establishment, the establishment of a worldwide totalitarian system that will destroy liberty of conscience and compel false worship, and that it would be so effective in bringing the world under his control that even Jesus was compelled to ask, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? 
Now, it's just at this very time that God's word calls for his people to look up, for your salvation draws near. In fact, Isaiah says, Behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. And we have that promise in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. That is the hope that we need to keep in focus during these challenging times. Now, I want to step back this morning and look at the big picture of the larger implications of what's happening in our world. As Christians, and particularly as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we understand that behind the scenes of world events, there is unfolding the final struggle between good and evil, between the followers of Christ, between Christ and his followers, rather, and between Satan and his followers. Now, this is not a message about the COVID vaccination. Whether the vaccination is effective or ineffective, safe or unsafe, the facts of history will bear out. In the grand scheme of things, the actual vaccination is very inconsequential in comparison to the undeniable reality that it is being used as a catalyst by the devil to bring the world further under his control. In heaven... Satan, then Lucifer, had an idea. For some, it appeared like a good idea, an idea worth investing in. After all, his position gave him influence, and his promises were convincing. Now, Ezekiel talks about it like this. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading... You became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mount, mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, this prophecy anticipates the final destruction of Satan, which has not occurred yet. But I want to draw our attention this morning to the fact that Satan, it indicates here, was involved with trading. Now, the King James Version says merchandise. Now, Satan in heaven was trying to sell an idea, one that apparently looked good but was predicated on a lie. After all, Jesus indicated he was the father of lies. Ezekiel doesn't give us a great deal of insight into what was contained in the perspective, prospectus of Satan's new startup, but Isaiah sheds a little more light on what he was selling familiar passage to many of us, and Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14 says this, "'How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the cloud. Clouds, I will be like the Most High. Now, Lucifer coveted the position of God. He began to entertain the idea of establishing a new order, a new system of government in which he would occupy God's position. And the disaffection that began in his heart, he didn't keep to himself. He began to whisper it among the angels convincing them that they and he were both victims for not receiving from God the honor they deserved and proposed to establish a new government. And he was looking for investors in his project. The Great Controversy, page 498, says this, the discord which, he had, which his own course had sown in heaven, Satan charged upon the law and government of God. All evil, he declared to be the result of the divine administration, he claimed it was his own object to improve upon the statutes of Jehovah. Satan's ideas for a new system of government contained staggering accusations about the government that presently existed. 
that God had established, one that had provided for the peace and harmony of the universe from time immemorial. The ideas he implied the universe had never thought of before. Is God's law really a restriction of freedom? Is God actually selfish, seeking to exalt, exalt himself by demanding submission and obedience? Would greater freedom be found in rewriting God's law and setting up a new society? In rebellion against God, Satan was promising a greater freedom and a brighter future. One-third of the angels decided to invest in the new project. And Satan's startup began with the attempt of a hostile takeover. Now, Revelation 3, Revelation 12, rather, tells us that so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It's interesting to me that God didn't destroy him immediately. God, in his wisdom, permitted Satan to carry forward his work unless the spirit of disaffection ripened into active, until the spirit of disaffection ripened into active revolt. It was necessary for his plans to be fully developed that their true nature and tendency might be seen by all. It often takes time for a lie to unravel. Now, just what type of government was Satan seeking to overthrow? The highest value in God's government is unselfish love. God's law is the codification of how love operates within functional, perfect relationships. It's the foundation of his government. The happiness of all creatures, all created beings, depends upon their perfect accord with the great principles of righteousness. Imagine living in a world where everyone's heart was in harmony with God and His law. How different would it be? Great controversy again. Page 493, God desires from all His creatures the service of love, homage that springs from an intelligent appreciation of His character. He takes no pleasure in a forced allegiance, and to all He grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. God's kingdom operates upon fixed principles that do not change with the changing of circumstances. Love and freedom, truth, and the law form the foundation of God's government. And among these, law, or love rather, is the motivating factor in God's kingdom. These four elements, love and freedom, law and truth, are so connected together that to abandon one is to abandon them all. The freedom of choice is a value so important in the kingdom of God that he will not violate your free will through the use of force, even when allowing you to exercise it could lead to your eternal ruin. Now, if Satan is going to establish a new order... It needs to be founded on new principles. Satan's government is founded on the principles, and I use that term loosely because arbitrary power is limited by no fixed principles. But Satan's government operates on the premise of fear, force, power, and deception. Fear becomes the motivating factor in the kingdom of, in the kingdom of Satan. Now, how are you going to sell this idea to any being that has any sense enough to think? You do it through lies. You do it through deception and fear. And fear often motivates to action under the threat of force made possible by arbitrary power. Now, after being removed from heaven... Satan shows up in the Garden of Eden with his prospectus. He's looking for additional investors, but he knows that he will never, never sell his plan on the merits if Adam and Eve can see the whole picture. So he hires an agent and uses live, live animation to sell his idea through a talking serpent. He couches his idea in deceptive, entertaining propaganda to an unsuspecting, innocent audience. 
Sounds a lot like today. Essentially, the discussion with Eve went something like this. Eve, you think you are free, but you are not. I'm here to tell you that you are oppressed, you are a victim. God has given you lots of rules that are essentially restricting your freedom. He has set things up here on earth for the primary purpose of protecting His interests, not yours. You are trapped in an oppressive system, and God has so concealed it, He has concealed it so well that you don't even know it. If you'll just sign here, everything will turn around immediately. So Adam and Eve sign up. The human family comes under the jurisdiction and the control of Satan's government. And things did change immediately, but not for the better. Fear took the place of love. Force became the new law of humanity. The arbitrary exercise of power destroyed human freedom, and deception and lies occupied the place where only the truth was before. With such impressive investors as Adam and Eve signed on to his program, it was easy for Satan to find additional backers. In fact, no one could resist his offer. When man sinned, his nature became evil, and he was in harmony and not at variance with Satan. The human race was deceived into investing in Satan's new society And God would not allow them to come completely under His control without providing a way in which they could be free if they so desired. Genesis 3.15, we read in that tremendous promise that I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise thy head. His heel. I want to tell you this morning, all our hope in the present and in the future hinges upon that promise. The enmity that God had promised to place in the heart of Adam and Eve and the rest of the human family was a power that was to withstand the dominion of Satan. This promise would place a limit on Satan's ability to establish absolute universal rule over the entire human race. It was also the assurance of a redeemer. Christ would come and reestablish God's kingdom, voiding the contract that Adam had signed with Satan and giving, giving every member of the human family the opportunity to once again be part of God's kingdom. It was also an open declaration by God of war against Satan's kingdom in this world. And don't think that that, fa- that fact went unnoticed by Satan. He recognized in this promise the possibility that he might not succeed to establish a kingdom under his absolute control. He recognized that he had to work quickly to thwart the enmity against him and to destroy the hope of the promised Redeemer. And so effective were his plans that within a few short generations, there were only eight people on the planet that had not fully embraced his new society and joined his rebellion. The Bible testifies in Genesis 6, 5 that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In order for the human race to survive and the promise of a redeemer to be fulfilled, it was necessary for God to send the flood to bring a close to the universal evil that had swept over the planet. Now, after the flood, waters had receded God had instructed Noah's family to disperse throughout the earth, but Satan had a better idea. He found plenty of like-minded individuals to invest in his new plan. It was actually the same plan that he had had all along. He set about to establish a worldwide system that would centralize all power of governance in a system that he could use to control mankind. Genesis 11 reveals that within a few hundred years of the flood, Satan had succeeded in bringing the world under his direct rulership in order to eradicate the knowledge of God from the human race. Ellen White puts it this way, the builders of the Tower of Babel were determined to keep their community united and to found a monarchy that should embrace the whole earth. 
Thus, their city would become, would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its, its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, the primary architect of which was Satan himself. The tower was to serve to unify man together under the consolidated power and unified rulership of a centralized government. Its very foundation was laid in the philosophical premise that rejected God and looked to man as the means of his own salvation. Had this confederacy been permitted, a mighty power would have, been born, would have borne sway to banish righteousness and with it peace, happiness, and listen to me, security from the earth. So dangerous were these plans of centralizing world power to the future of the race that God found it necessary to supernaturally interpose. Genesis 11, 6 to 8, the Bible says this, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from over all the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. God knew how quickly those who aligned themselves with Satan could create a totalitarian form of governance that would then destroy anyone remaining loyal to him. In fact, this has been Satan's plan all along. Confounding the language of Babel is actually a great blessing. With multinational, multilingual, and multicultural world, a global consolidated apostasy was much more difficult. Each of the groups might yet pursue an evil course, but these divisions would forestall a concerted and universal opposition to God. Now, Revelation reveals a time when the linguistic, cultural, and national barriers erected by God at Babel will be largely broken down. And Satan, once again, will unite the world under, under a totalitarian system completely under his control. Now, in confounding the language at Babel, God designed to forestall this universal apostasy until the Redeemer could come and until he could raise up his remnant, a worldwide movement in these last days armed with the everlasting gospel and prepared to withstand the final movement that is presently working to unite the world and establish Satan's worldwide rule just prior to the second coming of Jesus. Now, having failed to defeat Christ when he came to this earth, Satan has redoubled his efforts to establish an absolute tyranny over the world for the sole purpose of blotting the knowledge of God from the earth and destroying those who persist in proclaiming it. Now, Revelation 12 says this, Rejoice, O heavens. This is in the context following the work that Jesus accomplished for humanity on the cross. Rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. After the cross, Satan reestablishes efforts to finish the work of universal control that he failed to complete at the Tower of Babel. For 1,260 years, he plunged the world into the dark ages, working through illicit alliances of political governments and apostate religion. His attempt to establish worldwide control, however, was thwarted by God's Spirit working in the hearts and minds of those who chose to follow God's word and to refuse to surrender their hearts and minds to anyone other than him. They took a stand for their liberty and refused to make their, make their consciences, consciences subject to any power other than God. In order to protect his church from the collectivism that was threatening to destroy it in Europe, Revelation 12 reveals that God provided a refuge for his people in the wilderness. Late in the 18th century, while Satan was trying to maintain his authoritarian rule in the old world, Revelation 13 reveals that the very place 
where God had provided asylum for his persecuted church, would arise a new nation on the stage of history. And at this point, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles out. I want to read Revelation 13, the last part there. Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. We know this well. We're not going to take the time to unpack this completely. Time won't allow it. But I want to read just a portion of this because this is a portion of Scripture that is unbelievably and incredibly relevant for us living in the times in which we live. Revelation 13, beginning in verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those that dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he makes fire come down from heaven in the, on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their forehead, on their right hand or in their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, in Bible prophecy, as many of us well know, God uses beasts to represent a nation, a political or a religio-political entity. And the symbolism used in the context in this chapter reveals beyond the shadow of a doubt that this prophecy is depicting the United States of America. If you are not familiar with these things, some of you that are listening online or here may not be, and I would encourage you, find someone who can study these things with you. We need to understand the, the revelations that God has given us in His Word, especially for these last days. Now, this, this description that we find here in verse 11 is very interesting of this power. It says there, reading it again, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. This, this power, this nation, has lamb-like and dragon-like characteristics. The United States would be caught in a struggle between the principles of God's kingdom, love and freedom, law and truth, and the principles of Satan's kingdom, fear and force, power and deception. This nation was founded by individuals who realized that Satan's kingdom and the principles upon which it was founded, instead of being the utopian dream of a better and more free society, produced rather untold misery and pain. And for this reason, they decided on a new course, to form a system of government based on different principles, principles of God's kingdom derived from the Bible. Instead of fear, there would be respect. Instead of, co instead of coercive power and monarchical authoritarian rule, there would be the rule of law and personal responsibility. Instead of the consolidation of power, there would be individual liberty. Deception and lies that are necessary to maintain authority and through power would be replaced by the truth. Great Controversy, page 441, Ellen White says this, Among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. Their views found place in the Declaration of Independence, which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with unalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And she continues, she says, the Constitution also guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted, every man being permitted to, wor to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. And then she adds these two very insightful statements. 
Republicanism and Protestantism became fundamental principles of this nation. These principles are the secret of its power and its prosperity. The two horns described in this prophecy represent these two fundamental principles that make the United States of America unique in the world, civil and religious liberty. She continues in the great controversy. She says, the framers of the Constitution recognized the eternal principle that man's relation with his God is above human legislation and his right of conscience inalienable. Reasoning was not necessary to establish this truth. We are conscious of it in our own bosoms. It is this consciousness which, in defiance of human laws, has sustained so many martyrs in the tortures of the flames. They felt that their duty to God was superior to human enactments and that man could exercise no authority over their consciences. It is an inborn principle which nothing can eradicate." Close quote. Now, if you were Satan, how would you feel about a nation whose founding principles were a direct threat to the kingdom that you were trying to establish on earth? The great genius of the American founding is that the state is subordinate to the individual. The people are sovereign, and so long as this remains true, people remain free. The Constitution was designed to protect the rights and liberties of the individual. It was designed to limit the power any one person or group would be able to obtain and to exercise. It was to leave every man free in his person, his property, and his liberty to be to prevent the majority from being able to tyrannize the minority. And this is why Satan despises this republic and its founding documents. The principles espoused and the virtues facilitated stand in the way of his authoritarian designs. This is also why he is doing, working tirelessly to undermine our liberties and to spread confusion and division. In addition to having these lamb-like qualities, a change, the Bible says, would take place in this power. A time would come when these, this nation who espoused these two lamb-like qualities would begin to speak like a dragon. It would exchange its founding principles of individual liberty guaranteed by a constitutional republic for the communistic style of totalitarian collectivism. And based on what we are seeing in our world today, I doubt any of us would argue that that is no longer a thing of fairy tales or alarmists. Ellen White continues, she says, this prediction that the United States will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast plainly foretells a development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested in the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard beast. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. By such action, the United States of America will give to the lie give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles which it has put forth as the foundation of its policy. And then she adds, such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. She says, America's precious freedom of religious belief and practice is in danger of being destroyed by those who would force the conscience of the minority to conform to the wishes of the majority. And in Testimonies, Volume 5, she says, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. And we live in a world today where there are few, very few, particularly the younger generation, when, when they understand the significance of the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and our founding documents. 
Most of the countries around the world are turnkey tyrannies. All they need is a catalyst like a pandemic to turn their countries into top-down authoritarian rule, and it is instantly put in place. We don't have to look much further than Australia to see that this is true. The only reason that America is different is because we have a constitution that safeguards to protect us from authoritarianism. But they are, these principles are beginning to buckle under the collectivist agenda that Satan masterfully is working to reframe history. Most young people today are taught that America was founded as a slave colony and that our founding documents were designed to protect the interests of rich white men. Not only have young people grown up to despise America, but also the principles, which they are probably entirely unaware of, that have made this nation the freest and most prosperous nation in history, and I might add, that have, allow, that have allowed the gospel to be proclaimed around the world. And they are willing to embrace socialism and to sign up for the false promises of collectivism. Now, we need no longer look to the actions of the Supreme Court this last week to see how, how this barrier of a constitutional government can protect us from authoritarian overreach. Now, Revelation describes the final establishment of Satan's worldwide totalitarian system, which it describes as Babylon. It harkens back to the Tower of Babel and is Satan's last attempt to finish what he started in bringing the world fully under his control. It is a coalition of political and religious entities that align themselves together at the end of time in order to destroy individual liberty and to force compliance to a universal mandate of false worship. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have long talked about the future unfolding of the events described in Revelation 13. However, as events are unfolding that are preparing the way for what is soon, Ellen White says, to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise, I am afraid that most of us are asleep. In fact, quite honestly, I'm shocked at the indifference as we see the foundation of our freedom and liberties being destroyed. Many of us are perhaps waiting for the fulfillment of some future event that we have in view as the key to some apocalyptic vision that we are confident we have clear in our minds. We are naively, we are naively waiting for a frontal assault on religious liberty when the enemy is tunneling under the wall and destroying the foundations of liberty of conscience upon which religious liberty stands. We have equated in some ways, religious liberty to the Sabbath and the Sabbath only, and we expect to wake up and take our stand someday when we see a law enforcing false worship. I want to posit to you this morning that at that time, it may be too late. What if the unfolding of Satan's final plan is less like a mousetrap sprung suddenly and more like a serpent? that entwines itself around you slowly, that its constricting power is barely felt and therefore raises little cause for alarm? What if you are slowly being led into a trap until you are so fully bound in Satan's totalitarian grasp and you realize too late that you have been seduced by his ide ideological deceptions and have no power or even desire to resist because you have fully succumbed to his lies. I want to remind us this morning that religious liberty does not exist in a vacuum. Religious liberty rests upon the broad foundation of civil liberty, the principles of unalienable individual rights and personal accountability to God. Civil and religious liberty stand or fall together. Alexander Hamilton put it this way, civil and religious liberty always go together. If the foundation of one be sapped, the other will fall. If we refuse to speak or to seek to silence those who raise concerns regarding the encroachments upon the liberty of conscience because we don't see the issue as a matter directly related to li religious liberty, we have entered upon extremely dangerous ground. Ellen White said this, 
We are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. She didn't say religious liberty. She said liberty of conscience because liberty, religious liberty stands on the foundation of liberty of conscience. And when liberty of conscience is gone, there will be no need to cry out for religious liberty. Satan knows that he cannot wage a frontal assault on religious liberty in the United States. It would raise too great of an alarm. Instead, he seeks to slowly undermine civil liberty because he knows that once people surrender their civil liberty, liber liberty religious liberty means nothing. And many of those who are called to be watchmen on the wall, standing up for civil liberty, are not willing to speak up for fear of being misrepresented or being accused of being political or divisive. Once civil liberty is destroyed, arguments for religious freedom and tolerance become irrelevant. How, do, how effective do you think Seventh-day Adventist church leadership would have been in Nazi Germany making the case to Hitler for religious liberty once the population had been subjugated by the Nazis and their civil liberties destroyed? Universal religious intolerance emerges in the vacuum left by the prior dissolution of civil liberty. The dissolution of civil liberty in our times is brought about in consequence of either the passive complicity or the open applause of those who should have been her most ardent defenders. Perhaps those who acquiesced to the demands did so because they were convinced that the surrender of individual liberty was for the common good. I want to remind us again that Satan will always disguise his true intentions behind the best interests of society. In fact, the argument over the common good is at the heart of this and every other struggle for freedom and liberty. The problem with the common good is that it represents a blank check justifying any and all behavior by those in positions of authority. It is a cloak worn by those who would tyrannize the population for their own good. In fact, Albert Camus put it this way, he said, the welfare of the people in particular has always been the alibi of tyrants. We need to be careful and we need to carefully consider our positions and not assume that having silently acquiesced to the violation of liberty of conscience and the removal of the foundation of civil liberty in the present that we will suddenly champion religious liberty when the events of Revelation 13 unfold. Evangelism 694, if every watchman on the walls of Zion had given the trumpet a certain sound, the world might ere have heard the message of warning. But the, the work is years behind, Ellen White said, while men have slept, Satan has stolen the march on us. Hannah Arendt in her book, the rise of totalitarianism warned that in the final stages of totalitarianism, an absolute power, an absolute evil rather, appears. Now, we know this to be true in a, prophetically, in a prophetic sense because God has revealed it to us in His Word. It is the fact that it arises in stages that raises no alarms and causes people to be complicit in its rise to power. As we think about these things, I want to share with you, I want to read with you as I bring this around to a close, a little excerpt from a book called They Thought They Were Free by Milton Mayer, speaking about what it was like as the totalitarian regime in Germany began its stranglehold on the people. To live in this process is absolutely not to be able to notice it. Please try to believe me. Unless one has a much greater degree of political awareness, acuity, than most of us had ever had the occasion to develop, each step was so small, so inconsequential, so well explained or on occasion regretted that unless one were detached from the whole process from the beginning, unless one understood the whole thing was in what, what it was in principle, what all these little measures that no, developing, no, that no patriotic German could resist must someday lead to, one no more saw it developing from day to day than a farmer in his field sees the corn growing. Each act, 
Each occasion is worse than the last, but only a little worse. You wait for the next and the next. You wait for one great shocking occasion, thinking that others, when such a shock comes, will join you in resisting somehow. But the one great shocking occasion, when tens or hundreds of thousands will join you, never comes. And one day, too late, your principles, if you were ever sensible of them, all rush in upon you. The burden of self-deception has grown too heavy, and you see that everything, everything has changed and changed completely under your nose. The world you live in, your nation, your people, is not the world you were born in at all. The forms are all there, all untouched, all reassuring, the houses, the shops, the jobs, the mealtimes, the visits, the concerts, the cinemas, the holidays. But the spirit, which you never noticed because you made the lifelong mistake of identifying it with the forms, is changed. Now you live in a world of hate and fear, and the people you, who hate and fear do not even know it themselves. When everyone is transformed, no one is transformed. Suddenly, it all comes down all at once. You see what you are, what you have done, or more accurately, what you haven't done. For that was all there was required of most of us, that we do nothing. You remember everything now, and your heart breaks. Too late, you are compromised beyond repair. Now is the time to stand up for the principles that have founded this nation. To abandon those principles is to abandon religious liberty. Those who have yielded step by step, says Ellen White in Prophets and Kings, to the worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will then yield to the powers that be, rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. God has given us sufficient warning regarding Satan's final deceptions, that as I titled this message, no one need be deceived. Furthermore, God has called us to oppose the overreach and the undermining of the principles of religious freedom and liberty of conscience with all the strength and the vigor that His Spirit engenders and to champion the truth through submission to his will and a proclamation of the message of Revelation 14. It's the message that God has given his people for this very time. It's the message that counteracts Satan's final deceptions to prepare individuals to stand on the side of truth and principle, receiving the seal of God and the mark of the beast. In great controversy, Ellen White states this. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in His Word. They cannot honor Him only, they can honor Him only as they have a right conception of His character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified their mind with the truths of God's Word will stand through the last conflict. To every soul will come the searching test, shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Brothers and sisters, we cannot turn a blind eye and pretend that things are going along, along as usual. We will, find, we will wake up too late and find that we are on the wrong side of eternity. And my appeal to you this morning is found in Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. God is calling for a people who are unashamed and unafraid to stand up for the truth in these last days, as, pop, as unpopular as it may be even among people who should know these things. Let us submit ourselves to God that he might give us the strength and the grace to press forward. Jesus is coming soon.
Let's pray. Let us pray together. Father, thank you. You have not left us in darkness as the darkness envelops this world. We stand upon the firm foundation and the, sure, the surety of your word, looking to heaven, submitting to Jesus, and asking for strength. And Father, as we see these things unfold, may we not be deceived into following the easy path. And Father, if it means we have to stand alone on the plain of Dura, may it be so. And Father, we know that we never stand alone.